Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, and on behalf of Jewish Funders Network, I'm happy to welcome you to today's special lecture on reopening economies with Dan Ariely. Dan is the Israeli-American best-selling author of Predictably Irrational, and will share the lessons behavioral psychology offers to help governments begin to reopen their economies safely. He will detail experiments that show how, to, how the decision-making we do around coronavirus is not as rational as we think it is, explain how governments can help afford people more of a sense of control in this time, and offer predictions as to what habits and behaviors will and won't change. Dan will also share with us his fascinating work beyond the coronavirus, harnessing the power of behavioral econ economics to address and solve major social problems in Israel. And hopefully at the end, we will have a few moments at the end for questions and answers. So please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we will moderate that at the, at, at the end. And with that, I would like to introduce Andre Spaconi, president and CEO of JFN for some opening words and in, to further introduce our speaker. Thank you, Andres. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tamar. And um, welcome everybody to the, um, to this, to this session. Uh, not much more to say about Dan, uh, what you heard, uh, just that it's a great honor for us at JFN to have him. Um, he's an amazing thinker. Um, uh, related the ways, I mean, in, in how we think and how we take decisions and how we act and how our behaviors are shaped by forces that, you know, inside our brains that we don't fully understand. I, on a personal level, um, um, uh, I had a few conversations with Dan about all sort of top topics and I find them um, very uh, enriching and, and uh, eye-opening. And I'm, I, I never told him that, but I'm actually very, very grateful to some advice he gave me about how to manage uh, from the behavioral perspective, from the psychological perspective, the cancellation of our conference, not the cancellation, the, the postponement of our conference. And uh, it, was, it was really good advice from somebody that really knows how the brain works. So Dan, we're really uh, thrilled to, to have you, this is a real treat, uh, having a probably one of the persons that understands best uh, how our brains operate and to give us an opportunity to reflect about how we can harness these, 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 these forces and these behaviors and these uh, mental mechanisms that we're mostly not aware of to our service, you know, and to the service of our society. So. This presentation is going to have two 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 parts, as as Tamar said. One is more one is specific to coronavirus and what behavioral economics can teach us about the reopening and how can guide the reopening and to do it in a safe and 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 uh, in the best possible way. But then going beyond that, um, how governments and civil society and philanthropists like us can harness the the, the power of behavioral economics to produce social change. And Dan has really interesting stories about that from his work with the uh, Israeli government in that field that he was going to share with us. So without further ado, uh, floor is yours, Dan. So first of all, thanks a lot for the, for the kind word and the, and the introduction. Um, okay, so I thought that um, uh, what I'll do is I'll described you in the beginning um, my journey uh, as a social scientist with the coronavirus, and then we'll dive into a few very specific <coughs> questions. Uh, before I start, uh, a comment about half beards. Uh, I didn't uh, wake up late or lose a bet. Uh, many years ago, I was badly burned, and most of my body is covered with scars, including the right side of my face, including my hands. Uh, so I just don't have hair on this side. So it looks sort of symmetrical, but it's just uh, the way the explosion happened. Okay, so now that we covered facial hair, we can focus on the top. So uh, in my, uh, one of my day jobs, I'm a professor at Duke University. And in uh, early March, I was in North Carolina. Uh, and I started getting lots and lots of phone calls from different officers in the Israeli government asking lots of questions. Um, because as the corona crisis uh, was, was getting clear that it was going to be something to, to deal with, 
it was very clear that it's a, it's a crisis of biology and social science, right? There's no question that you need to figure out how to give instructions, directions. I mean, the, and the, the calls became more and more frequent, became more and more complex. The topics became more uh, difficult to deal with. And um, somewhere in the middle of March, I uh, showed up in Israel. And uh, the next two and a half months, I basically didn't leave my chair. Uh, 7 a.m. to midnight, only corona-related uh, activities. And in the beginning, it was uh, relatively straightforward. Uh, the, the questions were things like, how do you give directions to people uh, in the hope that they will follow? Uh, and, and not just follow, but knowing that people would violate the instructions from time to time, how do we make sure that they don't violate them by a lot? Uh, you all probably know uh, something that is called the what the hell effect. Uh, you're on a very strict diet, and then you start the morning, and you eat a little bit of a muffin. And then you say, ah, I'm not on a diet anymore. I might as well have a burger and fries, right? That's something very natural that if we break the rules, we say, let's just enjoy life. I'm going to hell anyway. I might as well enjoy it. That's where the expression is coming from. Um, and the question is, if people are going to violate from time to time, how do we make sure that they don't violate for too long? Because uh, what's true for calories, right? Uh, we as people count, if I, if I wasn't on a diet today, what's the point? That's not how nature counts calories. And the same thing is true for Corona. If somebody violates the, the rules, yes, they increase their own probability of getting infected and infecting other people, but it's not the end of the road. They, it's better if they go back home after this is over. Uh, but also, how do you get such instructions to be desirable? And how do you make it such that uh, people can tell other people when they uh, want them to, to behave differently? So there's a whole set of questions about instructions. And what might seem easy in the beginning becomes much, much more complex. Uh, what do you do with people that have to go to work? They have to go to work. How, how else? What, what do you tell them about doing in, in, uh, when they come back? Uh, then, of course, as you all know, we had some uh, real issues with the Haredi community. And I have to say to their benefits that uh, they really, um, it took them a while, but then they really uh, collaborated, uh, including Kikar Shabbat and, and some of the, the more extreme organizations uh, realize they need to collaborate and, and uh, really um, started working very hard. And we had similar problems in Ramadan uh, with the Arab community and they too uh, actually behaved in very uh, admirable ways. Then it became clear that uh, a teacher teaching 30 kids over Zoom in seventh grade is not getting much teaching. And we started studying what actually works and what doesn't work. Um, and um, and that, was, that was amazing to see kind of what are bright islands. Imagine like a multidimensional space, the teacher, the material, the kids, the kids learning environment, uh, the, the type of teaching. Um, and then you try to find out from all of this complexity, what are some things that actually work? And it turns out there are some things that actually work uh, they involve a lot of autonomy. They don't involve a lot of Zoom. They involve letting the teachers teach in the way that works for them. It involves letting the kids learn in a way that, that uh, works for them. It, it doesn't involve standardized testing or standardized um, teaching. Uh, it involves project-based learning where the different classes shed on the same material. Anyway, we learned a lot of things about what, what works and actually, as a side note, I will say that tomorrow I'm spending the day with the Minister of Education. And the hope is to take what we've learned from, from the corona period, from COVID-19 period, and to see how we might want to change the education system <laughs> more generally. I I'll, 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 might come back to this later. <clears throat> then it turns out that uh, domestic violence was, was on the rise. Um, not surprising in some ways, the conditions for domestic violence is you put people together in conditions with high stress. And we had lots of people, small quarters, uh, financial stress, health stress, 
noise, trying to study. Um, and, and, and of course, we had an increase in domestic violence, uh, some against women, a lot against kids. And uh, we started uh, two programs, one for the adults to help them identify their triggers, or what gets them and, and identify a safe spot at home that they could take themselves and, and basically do some routinized activity that took them out of the situation that invoked anger. We also did something for the kids. We did a little chatbot that asked kids how they're doing and kind of slowly directed them into, you know, are they sleeping well? Do they have enough to eat? Are they okay physically, emotionally, and so on, and kind of trying to map uh, the welfare uh, of, of the kids. And then there were lots of other questions. There were questions about releasing prisoners. So for example, it was clear that if a prisoner gets sick, they need three guards, right? three eight hour shifts, 24 hours. For each prisoner that gets sick and goes to hospital, we need three guards. What, what do you do with that? Like we don't have enough guards. Uh, so there were questions about releasing prisoners early, which prisoners to release early, under what, under what conditions. Then the question of the stimulus package became very clear. We clearly need that, right? Uh, what is the right way uh, to, to spend money? And uh, we did a, a project that nobody paid attention <laughs> a long time ago. I don't know if you remember, but in 2007, 2008, both Bush and Obama gave a lot of money back to people. And they did it in slightly different ways. Uh, Bush gave people a rebate check. So people got a check back in the mail that was called a rebate check and Obama decreased tax a little bit so the people got a little bit more uh, pay to take home. And both of those approaches were approaches to stimulate the economy. You give money to people, you want people to go and spend that money and you hope to go back to the economy. And both of those approaches failed. And they failed because in the Bush case, he gave people money that was called a rebate. And if I tell you that you get the rebate, it's your own money that you're getting back. Why would you go and spend it? In, in Obama's case, the money was too, too small. It was spread over the whole year. Nobody felt they had money, money to spend. Uh, what we did in our experiment was we tested a, a situation in which we uh, mailed people a prepaid debit card that said, spend the government's money. And it had a couple of goals. One is it, it was separate, right? The moment the money goes into checking or the moment money goes into saving, you're not going to spend it. And then the second thing is we wanted people to think of it as the government's money, not as their money, so that they would be more likely to, um, uh, to spend. it. Here too, uh, there were lots of questions about how you uh, get money into the economy. Uh, how do you get money uh, to the NGOs that are uh, holding the, the foundations of uh, poverty and education, and, uh, people in distress and so on. Uh, there were questions about uh, layoffs and compensation for businesses versus not. Uh, there were questions about helping banks and small businesses. There were lots of things. Uh, and I, I have to say that, uh, that here I failed uh, miserably. Uh, two nights ago, I spent an, again a long night in the Ministry of Welfare trying to get them to change one of their decisions moving forward. I'm, you know, I'm trying, but you know, this one I, I failed a lot. Um, in particular, I failed on uh, the, the rules about uh, welfare. That was maybe the biggest failure. And um, you know, if you look, if you look at uh, the German system, for example, uh, they pay employers to keep employees working. Uh, in Israel, the decision was to people who lay people off, uh, the people who are getting paid, laid off, get a percentage of their salary from the government. And I was arguing that this was psychologically a very bad idea. I was arguing that it was a bad idea because um, if you lay off people, they'll work zero. If they kept on being employed, even if they can't work fully, they will probably not work zero. They'll contribute something. Uh, maybe they'll even learn a course. The second thing I argued, and this we have some data to show, is that when you fire people or send them on uh, furlough, whatever it is, uh, you create more stress than if people are employed, right? It's a different situation, it's not the same. Uh, more stress, we don't need that extra stress, we can do without it. 
And, and the third is that it's very unlikely that you will hire the same people back. So uh, imagine an organization that you know, that you're a part of, uh, let's say it's an organization with 100 people. And one day all 100 people come to you and they say, unless you give us another dollar per month, we're leaving. How many of them would you give the pay increase and try very hard to stop from leaving? Hopefully the majority, hopefully the vast majority, but not everyone, right? There's a, there's a substantial number of people that if they left on their own accord, you wouldn't feel that bad about it and you wouldn't fight to try and get them to stay. Um, and, and that's kind of hidden unemployment. That's one way to think about it, but the, the better way to think about it it's the social contract of hiring people. And the idea is that if you're an employer and you hire people, you basically promise them some kind of, for better, for worse, we're going to help you out, right? We're not, even though legally we can fire people with a two week notice for morale, for collegiality, for the, the social contract that we have with our employers is that we hire people and we keep them going. And even if they don't, perform exactly right, or it's a, a, a slow period, we still have kind of the meaning of employment beyond the, the cold calculation. But of course, if you send somebody on furlough, and then the question is, do you bring them back? Lots of people would not come back. So, so anyway, those are the kind of things that we were uh, trying to deal with. In this case, a complete, a complete failure on my part to, to convince people to do uh, something, something different. And uh, we opened with a couple of foundations uh, a matching for charity that, that if people uh, put money to charity, the, the government, uh, the, the foundations added more money. Uh, we have now a big campaign in which we ask people to buy from small local business in advance, right? So we say, please, here's a list of local businesses. Give us the one that you like, how much your life is getting better because they exist would you please buy in advance from them, give them some uh, cash flow. Okay, and then, and then another thing uh, that we did was to try and help municipalities uh, think about how do you move from Corona period one to two to three. And let me, let me tell you what I mean by that. So before Corona, uh, we had a large range of activities, right? We, we slept, uh, we ate, we went to coffee shops, we went to bar, we hugged people. You know, there's lots of things that we did. In Corona period one, which is the part that we were in some kind of closure, uh, lots of those habits, activities went away and we were uh, dealing with a much more restricted set of activities. And sleep stayed, Netflix uh, increased, uh, going out uh, went went down. We ate, but we ate differently. Uh, checked more news, right? I mean, things things changed, but the range of activities we have kind of shrunk. And let's call this a uh, Corona period one. Sort of closed economy. Uh, everybody, depending on the on the country you live in, but basically kind of kind of closure. Uh, that's period one. Then there's Corona period two, and that's the period that Israel is right now. Yeah. And it's a, it's a time where you open things up. And when you open things up, of course, the number of people sick would go, would, would increase, uh, hopefully by not too much. And uh, the number of people who are uh, badly ill and dying would, would go up, but hopefully by not uh, too much, but, but you open the, the economy. And, and at some point there'll be Corona period three, which is uh, the virus is gone. And now another question is like in this Corona period too, what kind of habits will stay and what kind of habits would go? And, and, and one of the things I want to kind of propose here is that a lot of it has to do with experience. So, so let's, let's think for a second about the role of experience in helping us understand the world around us. Uh, so think about something like texting and driving. Right? Pre-corona, standard texting and driving, something that you know, most of us would admit that we've done before. 
how does it work that we text and drive? How does it work that we do this stupid thing? Well, we go on the road and uh, we think to ourselves the probability of texting and driving and something that happens is 1%, especially if we're driving slowly and something. Like that. <clears throat> we think it's 1%. So we look at our phone and we text something and nothing bad happens, right? It's only 1% chance. But we don't stop there. We now assume that maybe the probability is lower. You say to yourself, I thought it was 1%, but I just did it and nothing bad happened. So maybe it's 0.9 of a percent. And again, then you say maybe it's 0.8 of a percent and eventually the probability goes down. So what happens with, with small probability events is because they don't happen very often, the experience leads us into believing into false security. Now, think about leaving COVID period one and entering COVID period two. Um, think about an activity like going to a supermarket. You'll go to a supermarket. You have to. There's no way around it. You'll go to a supermarket. Yeah, for most people, right? You'll go to a supermarket. And one day, there'll be something unpleasant. There will be somebody that would, would hand us their hand to shake, and we will feel awkward not doing it, and we'll shake their hands. And there'll be a time when somebody will be without a mask. And there'll be a time when somebody will bump into us. There'll be all kinds of things happening. And the odds are that nothing bad will happen. Catching Corona is not a 100% event. It's a low probability event. So over time, going to the supermarket will feel safer and safer and safer because nothing would happen and happen and happen right? for, most, for most people. And that kind of activity will basically take the high level of anxiety and reduce it over time. What, what would happen to things that we don't have to do? Like getting on a flight or going to a movie theater or to the opera. Those things we will not have the experience that will teach us that these things are less dangerous than we, than we thought. So we will not have this corrective mechanism to help us understand how these things uh, really work. So therefore our anxiety, like you know, Corona period one, high anxiety closure, Corona period two, probability of catching the virus is lower. We figured out some things. Um, the, risk is, the risk is lower, we're getting out, but still anxiety is higher than reality. As you have experience, anxiety will go down but if you don't have an experience, anxiety would be there. Um, now, what does that mean in practical terms? For example, for me, uh, I, I told you I teach at Duke, I have a research lab where about 50 people. Uh, when it's time to get back to the office, when Duke will tell us that we can go back, um, the nice thing to do seems like to tell people, if you don't want to come in, you don't have to come in. It's up to you. We're doing everything we want. We don't want you to be worried. If you don't want to come to the office, don't come. It sounds like the right thing to do. But every day that people do that, their fear of going to the office would not go down. And maybe the habit of not showing up would increase, not maybe for sure. My plan instead is to ask people to come every day or four days a week, but for as little as time as they want, even half an hour. Why? I want people to show up and to see that nothing happened because we need that experience. Every time the anxiety is higher than reality, you want people to have, have the experience. Okay, so we have these two extremes. We have the extreme of things people have to practice and because of that over time, the anxiety would go down. We have the things people don't have to experience like going to the opera and therefore the anxiety would go down. And then we have something in the middle like the one I described to you where you could say, let's make an intermittent state in which we tell people come to work, but come for a short time. Now in this regard, uh, one of the things we're doing uh, in Israel is we, we issued uh, recommendations uh, to allow restaurants and coffee shops to uh, uh, go beyond their own boundaries. So the recommendation we made uh, was to allow coffee shops to go onto the sidewalks and even take up to four parking spots and restaurants. And what's the idea? The idea is that if you ask the question of would people go into a crowded restaurant? Not so much. If it was really spaced, 
maybe so. And after it was spaced and people tried down, over time you can make the, the, the chairs closer, you can go back to the sidewalk, back into the restaurant, but you have to give people an experience that would allow them to basically change their, uh, their level of fear um, uh, more often. Uh, I forgot to, to, to mention one thing before, so I'm, I'm jumping back. Uh, uh, we also did a couple of apps uh, to track uh, what's going on. Um, we, we track people through their cell phones at the, at the city level, and we created a national index of the different cities. We created competition uh, between the different cities. We also had the morning call with all the mayors to, to share what was working and what was not working. Uh, we also created a surveillance uh, app when we asked people to, to tell us what they see around them. And uh, we've alerted uh, the authorities in the last few weeks about the uh, lack of adherence that we're, that we're seeing, we're going to see, and indeed we, we saw. Okay. Um, so this is kind of a little bit of the, the kind of specific thoughts about Corona and you know, how do you design, design things specifically? Um, but, but I also want to talk about a couple of more uh, general, general points. And one is the question of motivation at the workplace. And what has changed in terms of motivation in the workplace uh, since, since Corona? Uh, so, so I've been interested in motivation for a very long time. I have lots of lab experiments on, on uh, motivation, uh, have field experiments, we work with companies, we try different bonuses, all kinds of things like that. Uh, but among the, the many projects that, that we have, uh, we had one in which we looked at how companies treated their employees, how employees perceived how the company was treating them, and how connected this was to the value in the stock market, the value of the company in the stock market. So, you know, every CEO stands on the stage and say the value of your employees is the best thing I have. Employees are the engine of our future, and that's true, but not everybody treats their employees this way. So we wanted to see how are employees being treated and how is it translate into the profitability of the company as it reflected in their stock value. And I have data on about 800 companies uh, going back to 2006. Uh, for a long time, <clears throat> many companies, and it's, it's a, a very large data set. And, and this is pre-corona, right? And I asked the question of uh, what kind of things, what kind of ways that companies treat their employees translate into higher profitability? Uh, so for example, uh, do you think that higher salaries translate into higher profitability? Turns out not. Salaries don't matter that much. What really matters is fairness in salaries. Companies that the employees perceive their salaries as being more fair do much better. What about quality of coffee? Quality of furniture? Matters? It doesn't matter. Turns out it doesn't matter. Uh, what about titles? Companies that have more titles or give them more freely also uh, doesn't matter. Uh, what about health benefits, financial benefits, retirement, also doesn't matter. The things that do matter is, I told you, fairness, it's about feeling appreciated, it's about giving employees the perception that if they make honest mistakes, nobody would, would be after them. In fact, they would appreciate that. It's about connection, it's all about those, those things. It's about connection, transparency, uh, understanding what the leadership wants, all these soft, fuzzy things, companies that the employees rate them in being high on those uh, are, are more successful in the stock market. Now, why is that? Why, why are all of those things matter? And they matter because of what we call goodwill. Uh, think about the minimum you have to do not to lose your job, and the max you could do if you're truly excited about what you do. The minimum you have to do not to lose your job, the maximum you can do if you're truly excited about what you're doing. That's a large gap. And it's a large gap in knowledge economy, right? Because in knowledge economy, 
it's up to us. I can be in front of a computer and do nothing. I can be in front of a computer and think very hard. Nobody can really monitor me because it's not about what I do outside. It's about how hard I'm thinking, how much I'm trying. And every time things are at the discretion of the individual employee, it's more of a question of goodwill. I can decide to put myself here. I can decide to put myself uh, here. Now, this question about goodwill was always true pre-corona and companies who got more of the goodwill of their employees did much better. At corona time, it's even more important. Why is it even more important? Because people are at home and people are at home with stress, which means that working, you have to overcome more things. There's, there's the stress and there's the desire to look more at the news and of course, you're at home and if you have kids, you, you want to deal with your kids. And working is a bigger task now than before because of stress and because of kids and, and family. So people need more internal power uh, in order to do it. And therefore, uh, it is more important to um, uh, goodwill is becoming more important. Uh, by the way, that value of goodwill uh, if we look at the period from 2006 to 2019 in the stock market, uh, it's worth about 6.5% over the S&P 500. Right? The companies who do well uh, on this, uh, may get, you get the premium you get if you invest this way in, in the simulation. It's about 6.5% a year over the, the S&P 500 from 2006 to 2019. That's a, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. Okay. So, so it's always been that kind of a handshake and a trust and uh, loyalty were important, it's, it's even more, more important now. And I think it will continue to be more important but that, because I think that for the foreseeable future, there'll be more work from home, uh, uh, plus there'll be some, some uh, extra, extra stress. Um, so that's one thing that is uh, kind of general and also, and also specific. Uh, another thing that uh, I've, I've mentioned a couple of times already is stress. And stress is very high. And I think we want to understand stress a little bit because we need to figure out how to help with it. And, and for me, the best example of stress is a, an old experiment on something called learned helplessness. And the experiment looked like the following. Uh, you take a dog and you put it in a cage. And from time to time, there's a bell. And a few seconds later, the dog gets an electrical shock. Bell, a few seconds, electrical shock. Random times, bell, a few seconds, electrical shock. And that happens for a few days. And then you have another dog in a similar cage. And that second dog gets the first shocks as the first dog, but without the bell. There's no warning. Now think about what it means. Both of those dogs get the same physical pain, but one of them, the pain is predicted and the other one, it's not. What's the difference between those two dogs? We're really asking the question of how much are these dogs able to have resilience? How much are those dogs able in the future to withstand resilience, to, to withstand pain and have resilience? And how is the experience of a predictable shock versus not changes? Well, to, to examine that, after a few days in this apparatus, they put people, the, the dogs in a different apparatus. It was a room with a partition. And if the dogs were on one side of the partition and there was a light, if the dog stayed on their side of the partition, the guy like shot. If they jumped over the partition, it wasn't too high, if they jumped over the partition, they escaped the, the shock. And then again, at some point, light, if they stayed, they got the shock. If they jumped, they, they avoided it. What happened to the two dogs? The first dog walks around, light, electrical shock, they get frightened, light, electrical shock, they try to figure out what's going on, they explore, 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 eventually they figure out they can jump, and from that point on, every time there's a light, they jump, never, never get another shock. The second dog starts walking around, gets a shock, light, gets a shock, and they just lay on the floor whimpering. You see, the second dog basically learned that the world is a bad place. 
that there's nothing good you can do, that life just slaps you in an unpredictable way and there's nothing you can do. And the second dog, by the way, also de de develops a reduction in the immune system, what's called the natural, uh, the natural killer cells, and they basically have a, a very miserable existence. Now, why am I mentioning this? I'm mentioning this because COVID, to a large degree, is an exercise in learned helplessness. And we get different instructions from the federal government and the local government and what we see inside and the riots, of course, and the questions of the, the stimulus package and what the banks are doing and not doing. And in Israel, it's, it's just as complex in, 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 as the US. We don't have the riots, but, but uh, the instructions are very, very, um, the plan is very, very unclear. And uh, those of you who run organization, of course, that means that clarity is very important. Right? If you tell people, here is our plan for the next six weeks, and we might change it, but at least here is the plan. Much better than saying, we'll let you know tomorrow. And every day we said, we'll have to just let you know tomorrow. You want the, the perception of some certainty, some understanding. And then the last thing it means is that we all need some control. Now, do we have perfect control of our lives? No, of course not. A lot of control was taken from us. Can we have some control? Yes. Uh, so, you know, shopping therapy is a sense of control. It was something that was belonged to somebody else. Now you bought it and it's yours. That's a sense of control. I'm not recommending, by the way, shopping therapy, but I'm just saying that shopping therapy does help with the feeling of control. There's some exercises that are better for control, right? Something like sit-ups. If every day you could do another sit-up, that gives you a sense of progress in a sense of control. Meditation is one of those things. Walking, uh, not so much. Um, uh, for lots of people, opening savings accounts and putting some money into them on a regular basis give a sense of control. We need to do things. When so much of control was taken away from us, we need to do some things uh, that give us uh, back, back control. Okay. The last thing uh, I want to talk about is I want to talk about who I think will be the winners of this crisis. And I think there'll be basically three winners. I think there'll be FinTech. Right? All of a sudden, physical banks will become less appealing. Uh, there will be lots of reasons to go to uh, technology for financial decision making. And there'll be uh, more excitement in that field. Uh, remote health, right? Uh, people would obviously uh, understand the importance of being hospitalized in local community centers, not the big hospital, hospitalized at home, uh, care at home and so on. And the last one is education. And I want to tell you maybe a couple of things about, <coughs> about education. Um, so I don't know if I mentioned this, but, but uh, my, my work uh, here in Israel, we're, we're part of a, a company uh, a small company, a small organization that, that works with the, with the government. Uh, every year the government uh, comes to us and they uh, give us challenges. And the challenges could be how do you get more Haredi women uh, to work and how do you get uh, uh, more Bedouin women to work and how do you get uh, people to pay their taxes and how do you get the congestion to get lower and how do you get kids to study more at school, all kinds of questions like this. And we take each of those topics and we do what we know how to do, which is research. And we go into it and we, we study something and eventually we come up with a proposal of what we think the right approach uh, would be. And I want to describe to you one, one such experiment. Uh, so Israel, like many other countries, uh, want more kids and particularly more girls to study computer science, right? And, and it's a, you have to start early. Like if you wait until the kids finish high school, it's a little bit too late. So you want already at high school. Middle school is not that important, but you want high school, uh, more kids and particularly more girls uh, to study um, computer science. Um, so, so the Israeli government, but also Facebook and Wix and Google uh, have this class called computer science light. And what they do is at the end of middle school, they expose kids to these six weeks computer science light class. And then after that, uh, what they're saying is that more kids and particularly more girls go to, go to study computer science. And, and the idea is that um, the, 
uh, that small experience would get them to figure out that they can do it and it's nice and so on and then more kids and particularly more girls would start computer science. And the government asked us to digitize this a version of the six with plus. They said, look, it's expensive. Uh, it's, it's hard to give it to many kids. If you help us digitize it, we could give it to lots of schools and then uh, lots of kids would go and study computer science. <coughs> uh, and I said, fine, sounds like a really reasonable thing to do. But uh, I asked them, do we have any proof that those things actually work? And they said, no, there's no proof. We think it's worked, but there's no proof. I said, okay, so let me first, before I digitize, let me uh, test whether it's actually working or not. So, so the first thing I did um, was to, to study it. Some kids got computer science light for six weeks, some kids did not. And what do you think? Did the kids who got computer science light um, were more likely to study computer science, the same or less? If you don't mind, why don't you type in the chat window uh, what your prediction is? More the same or less? Less, the same, the same, more, less. Okay. Also, the way I'm asking the question, you probably, okay. Um, so it's a little tricky question and not nice of me, but basically what happened is, was the same for boys, no difference, less for girls. Okay, I have to say, I didn't expect that result. I expected maybe not such a big effect, but less was very surprising. So I said, okay, before I take this as an answer, uh, let me do it in a bigger way. So we did more classes, more schools. Some got computer science light, some got neuroscience, some got nothing. Same result. Doesn't matter for boys, make girls less likely to study computer science. So, so the first candidate was like, why? First of all, I didn't digitize the class, but then I said, why, why, what's going on here? And the first thought was maybe at the end of these six weeks, the girls feel they can't do it. It's called self-efficacy. Maybe they don't have the self-confidence that they can, they can do it. So I tested it. No, they feel they can do it. What did we find? And when I'll tell you, you'll say, oh yes, I knew that all along, but I didn't know it. It, it surprised me, it took me a long time to find it. It turns out that the first six weeks of, of computer science light are very, very boring. Uh, you basically learn to move a turtle on the screen. And, um, for the boys, it's great. They say, oh, you get to move a turtle on the screen. How wonderful. And the girls say, I don't find any meaning in that. That's not the job I want, right? So what happened is the girls are feeling capable, but they find that it's a meaningless, boring job. By the way, if they study computer science for the whole year, they understand what it does. But the first six weeks are really, you don't understand the meaning of this, like why are you doing that? And the girls at that age want something that has more meaning. So what did we do? We went around the country and we filmed young people, young kids, but particularly young women uh, who are doing computer science and health, computer science and design, computer science and education, something where the meaning is incredibly clear. And we created a system where the kids who were finishing middle school, when they were going to sign up for high school, had to go through our system. And as they were going through our system, we, we forced them to watch those movies. And what happened? We increased the number of kids who were studying computer science, both girls and boys. The increase for girls was about 25% increase. Uh, so what's the point? Uh, the point is that there's lots of ways to try and improve, improve behavior. Uh, let me <coughs> say it more generally. Um, if, if you think about the last 300 years of uh, human achievement, uh, what we've certainly achieved is a dramatic improvement in our physical conditions. Uh, it used to be that Superman could fly and we couldn't. So we invented planes. Superman could run very fast, we couldn't, so we invented cars. Superman could sit in the cold, we couldn't, so we have clothes and heaters. Uh, Superman could, you know, and so on and so forth. And if you think about it, our life is a combination of design, like pillows, you know, have different heights and blankets, and, and we have chairs that are, you know, different angle and how they move. 
And, and we basically have taken everything we can't do very well in the physical world, and we tried to build some kind of wrap of technology around that. And we didn't take people a uh, difficulty of, of being in a cold and say, be cold resistant. No, we built things around this. Now, at the same time, uh, as we make amazing progress in the physical world, uh, we also made life longer and much more complex. Uh, what we need to understand now about diseases and finance and education are just incredible. And, and the question, I think, from a social science perspective is what are the tools, right? What are the planes and cars and crutches and, and chairs and heaters and air conditioning? What are those tools to get us to make better decisions? Now, the good news is we're moving in that direction. The example I gave you with the kids in computer science, and particularly with the girls, is basically trying to home tune, tune to some degree a tool that would understand what people are not good at, right? We're not finding the motivation and give us that particular missing piece to get us to perform at the higher level. But of course, there's much more, much more work. Um, the example I gave you about the prepaid debit card it says spend the government's money. It, different tools, different ways to give money are going to have different effects. Uh, do you fire people and give them furlough? Do people uh, keep on being uh, hired? All of those are tools. They're about mindsets and, and how those things work and, and ways to um, uh, perform better if we only thought about this the right way. Um, okay. So uh, that's basically what I wanted to, uh, uh, to talk about and, and share with you. Um, we have uh, about 10 more minutes and I'm happy to take questions, comments, uh, concerns, any topic works for me. And I think Tamar would, would moderate. Thank you so much. There's so much that I'm thinking about now and digesting. So thank you so much for putting that, all this incredible information in a way that we can understand. I have a few questions from the audience. And like you said, we have a few more minutes to try to, to try to go through them. So if anybody else has, has any more, please write them in the Q and A box or chat me and we will try to get to as many as we can in these last minutes. So one that came in is you wrote in your book that positive motivation are more, more powerful than negative ones negative ones, reward is better than fear. How do you translate that into the corona world now? Yeah, very, very good question. And um, you know, the corona crisis, and I'm telling you this with great pain, um, fear is a very good short-term motivator. I think Tamar, that's, that's the essence of your question, right? So what happens is if you want people to do something now, fear is a very, very effective mechanism. However, fear doesn't last uh, very long. It's not a long-term motivator. The good long-term motivators are things that have to do with internal motivation, right? It's not extrinsic, it's intrinsic. Things that we find pride in, people think that we agree uh, on doing. And, and in, in Israel, there was the, the question of how much to um, frighten the population get obedience this way, uh, but then potentially pay the price later uh, when people find out that we, we've been successful, right? So, so, so Israel was very aggressive in the beginning. Um, uh, adherence was very high. Corona was very low. People looked at it and said, why did you frighten me? Right, and, and now what we're seeing is some, is some reaction against it. Now, of course, we had a particular challenge that both of our president and our prime minister were seen um, not to wear masks and not keeping social distance. There was some, some economic activity that was not explained logically. It looked like it was, it was not. So, so that also helped uh, create disbelief. But, but fear, very good for the short term, not a sustained uh, activity for the long term. For the long term, you want people to do things for positive, positive reasons. We're sadly not there. Right. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Thank you. And to shift gears, just because we have a lot of questions now coming in, so shifting gears a bit, so we have a question about how do the tactics you use to engage, persuade, persuade the Israeli market different, or how are they different than what you would use for an American audience? If you have a few key differences you want to share. <clears throat> yeah. So, so I, I will tell you, for example, in the Arab communities, <laughs> we had more time, right? Because Ramadan uh, started uh, in April, we, we, had, we had more time to, to prepare. And uh, what we did was we posted very large pictures of uh, older people in the villages and we say, we're saving those people, right? So we used what's called the identifiable victim effect and there was a very much rallying around, uh, around that. Um, my, my sense, and, and I'm, I'm saying something that I have not tested, is that um, camaraderie in Israel is, is higher than in the, in the US. I'm not just talking about the riots, right? But in general, camaraderie is higher. And a lot of things in Corona were about people doing for other people, right? Especially this is a case where young people have to take precautions uh, to, to help uh, older, older individuals. Um, now that, that message was very effective. In fact, when, when I just came to Israel, there was a group that I was trying to organize uh, that uh, agreed to be infected on purpose, right? We were, we were in the situations where we didn't really know much about the virus. We still don't know a lot. It's kind of shocking how little we know. Uh, the people who don't get it, I'm not taking the non-symptomatic. There are also people who are exposed and don't get it. And the people who are not symptomatic, we don't understand them. And there was a, a group of young uh, people who were willing to infect themselves at different level and help us collect uh, data for this. And they looked at this as a total, you know, for the public good. We couldn't get it going for all kinds of legal uh, reasons. Uh, but Israel as a country is a country that um, has very high camaraderie and I think very high camaraderie for the, the older uh, population. That doesn't always show, sadly, but, but I think it would, would have been easier. Um, and then the other thing in the US, as you probably know, uh, the security blanket is much weaker. So if you're a low income individual and you work on a daily basis as a delivery a person and one day you wake up and you have cough and fever, you can't self quarantine. Right, you don't have that ability. Israel is, is not great in terms of social blanket, but, but much, much better. So if, if it was me and I was in the US, I would uh, not work, I would not assume as much camaraderie. I would have pushed the camaraderie and I would probably push it more like pro community rather than uh, in a large way. And then I would also work much harder on the security blanket. So I have, I want to try to combine a few of these questions because we only have, I think we only have time for one more, unfortunately. So there's one that talks about much of the work that we all support is, discretion, is discretionary for participants, weekend retreats, birthright, adult education. How do we help overcome the natural resistance to participating, which is so much of what people do in engaging Jewish community and the ways that we, we have in the past? And then one that also came in that I feel is similar but different is how do you suggest Jewish leaders that are concerned about how to plan for high holiday services and missions back to Israel in the next nine months? So it's kind of coming back together as a community in a, in a different way that we, and how would you help yeah. the resistance? Uh, Tamar, if I, if I may add just, just one second, because just Definitely. I'm seeing a question in the chat that is particularly mm -hmm. relevant in terms of philanthropy, which yeah. talks about what, you, what would you think is the most um, intelligent way from a behavioral perspective of creating a stimulus package for the Jewish community, for folks that, you know, to, re, to reignite and rekindle Jewish life um, and help people access. So, so first of all, the, the first part of the question, I would say that it's, uh, I, would, I would recommend that we think about a version of how I want to get my lab back to work, right? If we just say birthright is just as usual leaving August 1st, um, that's not a good transition point. I think there'll be too many people that would be afraid. I think we need to develop an intermittent step, something in the middle. And I don't know what it is, right? 
Um, but it can't be staying at home and doing birthright from Israel, from your from Zoom, right? It needs to be some connection, some activity, uh, moving moving in that uh, in that direction. Um, in terms of Jewish philanthropy, I, uh, first of all, I, I need more time to think about this. But I think I think Corona has been a, a time that has made it very very clear that we're more fragile and more connected. Um, and, and both of those are important. And I think for me, the issue is, is really creating a system with more resilience. And the resilience is financial and it's health and it's relying on other people uh, for help. Uh, there's, a, there's an organization I, I work with um, that, that basically galvanized 15,000 uh, volunteers in Israel to start delivering food and so on. And, and we had a call with our Jewish community in Italy and th they couldn't get anything out. They couldn't, I mean, they, they, they were not a community. They were Jewish people in a very uh, Corona infected place that couldn't get a community. And eventually uh, we sent some volunteers there uh, to help them. And they were so shocked uh, that we did. But we do need each other. We do need each other. You know that this this time uh, proved it in, in in every possible level. And how do we develop those things, those connections, and basically guarantee that we'll be there for each other um, mm -hmm. uh, years to come? I think I think that's the for me that's the challenge that comes from the Corona crisis. We needed it. We can see the pain. We can see what happens when we don't have it, and we need to rebuild it. Thank you. Thank you. And I wish we had another hour or two more hours to try to, to um, go through more of the questions. We're right at time. Thank you so much, Dan, and for everybody.